The scientific revolution starts now. So I want the conversation that we have today to be focused on this question of what it means to understand nature and how physics has gone astray from understanding nature and what are the approaches that we can use to get a more complete picture. And I want to set on the table a certain skepticism about theories of everything. And I wonder if you maybe can start with explaining what you mean by that. What is it that you hope to find? What is your theory? What is a theory of everything? A theory of everything is a conscious framing of the world that gets it right. <laughs> so right now we all imagine some sort of framing of the world. You can't not, right? But as you grow and as you educate yourself, you right or wrong, change that framing. Okay. I'm not here to claim which one's actually right until it actually maps the real world and gives you, you know, predictive power. But at some point we wake up to the idea that we're actually changing our framing. Right? You could just grow up and then say at 18, you think of the world in a certain way, and then you get a job and you don't really change thinking that until you die. You just don't change your circumstances in a way that challenges it. So you kind of think, oh, it was only childhood that was changing how the world was. But for some people, they're always being exposed to new experiment, new experiences or new degrees of freedom in reality, like being put in different environments and actually physically engaging with different parts of the world with their fingers with their with their tongue with you know, with everything so that their brain is consciously mapping something new and having to then figure out how this thing fits into the world despite not being something you could have predicted from the way you thought the world was it's a complete new thing that wow that's a surprise right i think this is like the growth the process of conscious evolution Literally, I mean, we're all conscious because we tell a story in our mind about what the world is. We open our eyes and we see something, meaning we translate sensory data from the outside world in our brain about what it means and we see that thing, right or wrong. <laughs> but the thing is, is when we wake up at the point that the right or wrong can be there, that we started out vaguely pretty much wrong on everything when we first open our eyes. I mean, children don't really see the world, right? We think it's kind of just static and noise. They have to learn how to see. They have to learn how to pay attention to the cues of the things that we frame the world, which is what it means to learn how to see. And I think we're still doing that. The theory of everything is like pointing towards the end of that process, the process that we see more and more and more through as we grow up. Now, maybe people like to commonly say that we're 10,000 or at least 1,000 years away from getting somewhere like that. But that's absolutely true if you've trained all of your profession to not work on it. <laughs> if there aren't any professional people in the entire field of physics allowed to publicly admit that they're working on the theory of everything, which is the central goal of the field, <laughs> at what point do we admit something's going wrong? <laughs> Wait, can now, can, can you elaborate on that? So I, I, I guess I'm not aware that that's a taboo subject. Is, is, <clears throat> you seem to be convinced that that's something people can't publicly dedicate themselves to. Because isn't the standard model of particle physics kind of a theory of everything they're just kind of like the way that i see it treated is being like well we have all these fields and all the excitations of the fields give rise to all these particles and we don't really understand yet how we go from just fields to stuff but we'll figure that I out. i guess the bridge between that and cosmic astrophysical scale reality is still unmet by the standard model yeah but i feel like they're like aware and disturbed by it you know? Yeah. yeah, maybe you can just elaborate on, on what you mean by that being a, an off-limits topic. I mean, when you go into physics, you start out probably, well, at first you don't really know much about physics. So the introduction is just all, wow, this is all a thing, right? You learn about the solar system, you learn about uh, Newtonian physics, you learn about the ability to engage with the world on purpose at the level of Newtonian physics, right? You learn how to calculate things. It's really exciting to learn all these things. And along the way, you're told the story that what this physics that you're doing is, that you're engaging with, and what you're going to be at the end when you're a physicist, when you finish getting your degree, is somebody who does these sorts of things, somebody who is engaging 
in examples with all the stories that you filled with what physics is, right? Now, I'm not saying that nobody with a PhD works on actual meaningful work. Of course they do. All of them do. And I revere all that work. But all of them would also really revere the ability to get paid to work directly on trying to figure out the central mysteries in physics, to get funding that gives them the ability to sit down in their office and say, all right, let's, from the get-go, scratch everything out and start it all. What do we have to make sense of? Let's see what we can change in our understanding and see if that gives us any new purchase on the world. Right? This isn't really a thing that they're allowed to do anymore. In fact, it's, it's kind of scoffed. If you, if you were to mention you were doing this on the weekends at home, not at work, you would you'd be kind of, um, I don't know, taken less seriously, right? Which it's- to me speaks not to a lack of ability because of the circumstances, but more of a personal orientation towards this is fine. We have things mostly figured out. Like, I really think that there's this yeah. inherent oh. orientation in all of the physicists that we've spoken to. Because we, full disclosure, like we come, we're working on a book we mentioned earlier the book is about this question of like, what is the fundamental? Like when you dig down into physics and you end on fields, like can you imagine the fields as being something material? Yeah. Right. And so you put that in front of somebody who's a professional physicist and they're like, we don't do that. Yeah. Like the only reason I didn't major in physics as an undergraduate is because I got this strong sense that everything was done. Like I was like, I realized there was some disunity between you know general relativity and quantum mechanics but all of it just seemed like I I really got the impression from my professors that basically there was a few details left to sort out but like you know we got this all figured out and so I ended up going into neuroscience because it was a brand new field at the time and I was like wow there's so much stuff happening nobody knows anything about the brain this will be cool Um, but it took me years to get back into physics because it, it took that long to realize that hey actually everything's not quite right in the state of Denmark you know well, studying the brain is fantastic also, but it's, it's a tragedy. You didn't have the, the best teachers there to, to show you the mysteries right out the get-go, but you did come back to them, so congratulations. <laughs> I always thought it would be fantastic to, sorry, to teach math exactly backwards from the way we do, meaning if you have a four-year um, career in physics, say, the first entire year, Everyone's terrified with learning math at first. So the first entire year, I think you should expose them not to anything where they need to do math equations, but instead expose them to stuff that's way over the top, like black holes, time dilation, quantum mechanics, all the things that are like, we believe in our current story are real aspects of the world, but none of which, item by item, can be really explained in any coherent sense. We walk away feeling like, oh, I get that thing, <laughs> right? So it's, it's a Harry Potter mixed bag of elements of reality that no one really can explain to you. Then with the second year, I think, we should start history with concepts of ideas that allowed us to then start making sense of these things, these big, crazy mysteries that we discovered. I think first, expose them to the mysteries so they have something personal they want to wrestle with, something they want to make sense of. They've seen it. It needs to make sense now. And then let's start backing up with the historical ideas of how people first made sense of parts, what kind of concepts mathematically usually, how do they frame something in a new way to come up with something new precise that they could say, and then found that it matched in the world, and then we moved on from there. <clears throat> anyway, I'm ranting a little well, bit. Well, no, I think I that that's that. a really, really important aspect of it, because we've come across this a bunch in, in our conversations and our research and writing this book, where it's like, you have two approaches. You either come at something conceptually, And then mathematically, or you come at something mathematically first, and the results are not the same. And it seems that history is a stepwise jump of understanding something conceptually, and then having somebody come along who's like, I think I can put the math to this. Like, I think that's what Newton did. Like, everybody knows that nature is dynamic, but they don't have dynamic mathematics. And so they kind of all like stumble along without being able to evaluate how or even accurate. Einstein and his his famous thought experiments, you know, they're very conceptual. Mm-hmm. These revelations come conceptually, not mathematically. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And yeah, math is just such a turnoff too. But I, I love what you said about. Um, I think it's a turnoff because it gives people anxiety, right? They they feel inadequate. But I, I love what you said about introducing the mysteries first, and that's something I really take to heart in my own when I when I teach as well. It's like, hey, instead of here's the solar system. I'm like, you can read about the solar system in your textbook. Let's talk about what we don't know about the solar system. Like, 
why what's going there's so many anomalous strange things it's like yes. isn't this awesome isn't this just freaking incredible that like we've got you know like instantaneous communication i'm talking to you across hundreds of miles instantaneous like this is amazing and we still don't know why venus is rotating the wrong direction like we still don't know these basic things too and it's just so exciting and, and i think if kids come in with that level then maybe we'll have a lot more productive scientists 40 years from now well, I think all kids naturally do come in at that level. Mm. I think our system, honestly, over my lifetime, um, maybe I'm one of the lucky ones that had the, the best string of teachers, string of teachers, I don't know, but I also switched to philosophy of physics and they really focus more on the, the concepts of these. Oh, I just lost my track of mind. What was I, what was I saying? Sorry. The, the fact that students come into physics more focused on the mysteries and the anomalies and I oh, think that gets dropped so out of it. I actually have the opinion that uh, academia today isn't really like academia was 20 years ago and in the ways that it's different it's focused and driven and controlled by the interests of money far more right in the past that was a very separate thing in academia that kept that very separate there wasn't a support a point of pride right that your research was funded it was just you, you got funded any way you could to get the point of pride was the concept that you were after now it's very focused on money and i I'm not going to say everywhere. I'm just saying in my experience, it seems that the academia level has gone down. And that's maybe just a consequence of the fact that everybody now can't spend as much time thinking about the thing they would spend eight hours thinking about in one day before if they were an academic, right? Eight hours of solid straight thought. Does that happen in academia anymore? That used to be the gold standard, right? I mean, Einstein would sit down and think by himself, no phone interrupting him, no computer interrupting him, no anybody. He would literally put himself in an environment where there would be no interruptions and think on purpose all day. And this isn't really a main ingredient anymore. And when that goes away, it seems to me that consciousness itself is now no longer dedicated as much. It's more scattered. There's less. So. There's certainly less flow state where flow is the place of ideas. And I noticed this in myself, you know, as we're writing... Writing is one of those places where flow is indispensable. I mean, all creative endeavors, flow is indispensable, right? Because you have to do this magic trick of being able to keep the entire thing in your sights the entire time. Mm -hmm. You have to be able to see the beginning, middle, end, and connect all these pieces together and change them around and figure out how it remains a cohesive object. And if you're looking at a notification, even for a second, if you look away, it shatters into a million pieces and you can come back, but then you have to, you almost have to start at the beginning, right? Mm -hmm. Where you have to go all the way back and you're like, God, where, what, where, where, where were these ideas? Yep. Like, what are it the get there And it can take an instant to get back out. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And so I think that you're, I think you're diagnosing something really accurate, which is that there is a lack of, flow that's available even the way that even the way that we teach right like i when i was an undergraduate i remember feeling this strange tension at the number of classes that i had to take that all were completely unrelated to one another like they were all biology classes but it's not like genetics was taught integral to biochemistry and a class on evolution and a class on you know the history of science and all of it, it wasn't a concerted body of knowledge. It was mm -hmm. just, there's one textbook here, one textbook here, learn these things, tests, finals, go through the motions. And then at some point, hopefully you'll have enough time in your career where you can sit around and like, think about it. And it's crazy because we, I don't, I don't think that I don't, I don't want to speak for you, but I didn't really have the time to start thinking about these things until we started doing the podcast. And this is all that we do. And when would you have, right? I mean, in a normal life, just a normal person's life, when would you? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've mentioned it on the show before, but it's, I was really lucky in grad school that I was in a lab that had an engineering component that was sufficiently lucrative in terms of funding that we had time to play with other more scientific questions and we had no funding for those but we had a sufficiently promising engineering project that we had time to play and i don't think that that happens very often that that your boss will say hey just take the semester and tinker around with this system and see what you find see what's interesting don't there's no like hypothesis here there's nothing we're just like what's going on here 
I, mean, like, I think I think this is a, an interesting system. I bet there's something you can you can deduce, and uh, I just don't think there's much of a place for that in in this this paradigm. And it's so sad because, you know, we came in with this big class to grad school, and we had kids in our class who were like, "I'm here to earn win a Nobel Prize." You know, they showed up and they're like, "I'm gonna change the world." And you know, you very quickly find you're gonna work on what your boss needs done, basically. And it was just, it really cleaned out a lot of people, like, from the, from the class. It was very tragic. Um, and so, I, anyways, I, I don't know what the solution to that is exactly, but the, but we certainly we certainly do tend to find ourselves at a gridlock in a lot of these, these sciences because we're so fixated on just putting the next little dot on the sentence or whatever that we don't make these big reconceptions of, like, hey, we don't even have, we didn't even have time in grad school to look at the history for God's sake. Like I, I didn't know that I was studying elastic mechanics. I, I never once had a class where I actually got to go back and study the fundamental discoveries of elastic mechanics and read the writing uh, of Robert Hooke or whoever, um, you know, Poisson and, and these people. I, I just, it never happened. So I had to do that on my own after, after I graduated. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah, I, I don't know. I think, I think the, that independent institutions might be the way that this gets healed in the future. You know, it's hard to repair something that becomes aged and gets these mutations and break. Like all institutions kind of decay, right? So it's like the best hope we have is that you know some of these random billionaires will take an interest and support the creation of parallel institutions, maybe that can. And from what I understand, I think you're you're working on something like that yourself. Yeah, we're trying to make the physics monastery uh, grow into a place where we can invite anyone who wants to come be a physics monastery monk, <laughs> dedicate their time all day to whatever specific mystery they've identified that would they think help them better figure out the world. It doesn't have to be what I think. It's like we want diversity of, of backgrounds. Um, there's many more things to focus on, many different levels in science to to put your enthusiasm, but there aren't very many places for people to go where they can put their attention really focused there, but also have other people where they could go in a common room and have whiteboards and try to talk out the ideas and see, you know, sometimes just saying it out loud with other people listening, not even responding, just other people listening, helps your brain figure out whether it was a good idea or a wrong idea, or, you know, it helps you go further. You can be stuck without that. So having a place where people are actually dedicating themselves to this sort of aim, really helps people on many different fronts, but most importantly, it gives them the time and the space to dedicate their consciousness to the conversation. And that's the most important thing that we need. That's, that's the reason we've stagnated in physics for 50 years, let's be honest, because we're not actually working on revolutionary physics. Mm. That's the reason, guys. It's, it's not because we're all stupid from this generation. We're not genetically worse off, right? We're just distracted. We just need someone like Newton Right and Einstein to dedicate their thinking time, their hard, all their actual intentional thought on the purpose of figuring out the mysteries they've identified so far, so they can go deeper, so they can connect them, so they can understand them, and then identify even further mysteries. So, so that as they do, the world that they find themselves in becomes richer, more accurate. Right, but you can see more of the beauty in the world. Right, the, be the beauty is infinitely available but learning to see the beauty is the trick that's the entire thing we got to aim <laughs> for when we a get huge there, part of, le yeah. of learning to see is is i hate to say it but kind of forgetting what you learned in a weird way of, it's just kind of a weird way of putting it but it seems like in order to have a revolutionary perspective you need to be okay with with considering hey maybe these titans didn't have it all figured out which is very heretical yeah, and and time that we Go all ahead. have to like take on the whole concepts, take on their idea, frame it. Does it still make sense today with what we know, right? Try to hold the idea they had. Don't just take it on as an idea from a giant. That doesn't do you any good. Let's just step on their memorized. The goal is to get to a better comprehension. So if you don't understand how they got to where they got, you're not going to get further, right? Or you're at least not going to get to leverage their idea to get further. So, so. I oh, go ahead. I was going to ask what you make of the stagnation in physics, given that we live in a time of obsession with technological progress. Because those seem kind of orthogonal to me. Because if we're well, so obsessed well, with making progress, why why are our physics stuck? 
Well, who would you imagine the closest people to Einstein are like? If you imagine a group of close to Einsteins in the world right now, when they grew up, no matter what their path was, what do you imagine their incentives were? <laughs> they found themselves much smarter than other people, let's say, right? Or at least they noticed, oh, I'm, I'm pretty smart. I can, if I dedicate, I can figure anything out and I can do it. What are they going to dedicate themselves to? Probably finance. Yeah. <laughs> Quant stuff. This now, this isn't a damning thing. It was a smart decision. They made a rational decision, and that was the best way to get to the point where they could be somebody who had the resources to deserve a romance. That's the story we have in this script of reality, right? I mean, that, that was rational. The trouble is, is we all do that all the time, and if we get stuck there, always aim for that. Then we're reliant on the people who make it super rich to be the people who give the money for those who are actually figuring out science now. And remember, the ones who make it the super rich are the ones who, by definition, are the least fair among us. Out of all of humanity, the ones who have climbed to the top did so either by miracle one-time step, which we all hear about whenever it happens, or they made several business moves by being the least fair among us, the people who weren't satisfied with what they had already because they couldn't see enough beauty in the world that they saw. When they opened their eyes, they didn't see enough, right? So they thought dedicating their money even more was the way to get there. They got stuck. And that message was really alive from the get-go. And here's the really, uh, the most ironic part of it. I hate to interrupt, but I have a small favor to ask. If you like what we do, Go over to patreon.com slash demystifysci and sign up to give us a couple dollars a month. Your donations really mean the world to us. And in return, we give you both of our episodes for the week early, and we invite you to participate in what might be my favorite thing on the internet, which is the Demystify Psy patron show. It's basically an opportunity to come together and outside of the constraints of the podcast, really just dig into the questions that people have directly. And it's a really fantastic group of people. And if you sign up for our Patreon, you can become one of those folks. If you don't have any cash right now, that's totally fine. You can leave a comment, you can like, you can subscribe, you can come to our Facebook, our Discord, our Twitter. The links for that are in the description. But if you want to support the podcast and you have the spare cash, then come on over to patreon.com slash We can stay stuck there forever, or we can figure out reality to a higher level where all of these systems and now take advantage of people with all the money was a great idea when it first came about, but now it's been systematically taken advantage of in every way people could figure out. <laughs> That's the game now, right? So it's bleeding all of us to death. It's not the thing to really be happy about focusing on. If we can make people have an incentive structure where they realize, Hey, if I focused my career on figuring out reality, if, we as a species put enough attention on figuring out reality to get to the point where we don't just have electricity that can do this much more for us, but we can literally take energy from mass on purpose without making a bomb. We're not blowing things up. We're on purpose, logically reordering things because we know what the ordering is, right? If we get to that stage, <laughs> I think science will be reborn. I think the people that are, well, children, the scientists that's, a child investigating the world, seeing something new, getting excited by this new thing, because it means that there are new things. <laughs> Here's another one. I think that will continue to be the way we age. Instead of considering ourselves adults from 18 or 21 or whatever the cutoff's supposed to be, and, and then you think of yourself as the same person. I have this name. I am this person. I think this way. Everyone knows me. I'm not supposed to evolve much more after becoming an adult for some reason. I hope in the future, we're gonna have that incentive structure that takes away that evolution, completely just go away. We don't have to fight against it. I think it's just gonna go away and people are gonna start exploring their world more, spending more time at the beach, being in a cloud forest. Have you guys ever been to a cloud forest? <laughs> yeah, 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 absolutely incredible. I mean, yeah, we spend a great deal of our time, as much as we can afford, in the woods, because that's honestly where every single idea I've ever had has happened, I feel like. We actually had a really interesting experience the other day, because we went to... Have you ever been in a sensory deprivation tank? Mm -hmm. And people speak of it as like a really meditative place, and I think I can see that. But at the same point, there's something about being in the woods and in the forest and among all of nature that is so much more powerful than being just in this black box. And so, cause I go out into the woods and it's like a 
fire hose of ideas opens. It's just, I'm looking at all these things and how they're related to each other. And I start thinking about, you know, the material properties of the trees and the, the mm. funguses and the bacteria and like our relationship like watching to the it. ripples on the, on the river and thinking about light and magnetism. And it's mm -hmm. just so inspiring. I think both of us had, we were in different <laughs> tanks, but we both came out and we were like, yeah, I kind of wish we'd just gone to the woods instead. <laughs> Well, now, you know, I have the exact same experience, actually. I find that whenever my focus is on nature, whether it's something I'm familiar with in nature or not, if that's what my focus is on, there's an inspiration always around the corner. It's just if I'm in a room, a white wall room, <laughs> you have to really do work to get to the inspiration. But if you're in nature, you can just sit and try to be quiet and pay attention to it the inspiration comes because it's there. It's it's around us already. But if we do a lot of work to frame ourselves in a man-made world, then we might easily miss it. You know, I often wonder if some of these big revolutions in science that we're all kind of waiting for won't come from completely outside of the academy. Because I think about some of these, some of my favorite scientists, like like Charles Darwin, right? Not Not an academic guy. He kind of failed out of med school, went to I think theology school did all right there, but he ended up just basically getting on a boat and he just ended up taking, he just was curious and was just looking at things for years and years. Um, you know, to some extent, uh, Copernicus was notes. kind of like, you know, they see this over and over where people just start to look around and the scientific m mainstream, the Academy at the time is telling them, eh, you know, we've got this figured out. Don't, don't, bother or like these ideas are silly you don't need to reformulate this and they're kind of they're not bothered by it they're not they don't feel put down by that they're more just like well I, you know you guys can do think whatever you want i'm i'm just more I'm, my curiosity is more important and they're driven by that through their whole life and i think darwin would have waited until he was dead to publish that book if he didn't think that he was about to get scooped and i think he ended up collaborating with wallace on that first uh truncated version of his bigger thesis and um, I know Copernicus sat on that book his whole life too, carried around in his breast pocket from what I understood. And, you know, he discussed it with his close friends and so forth. But these weren't academicians in the sense that they were revered for their ideas in their lifetime and, you know, trying them out at the national conference or whatever. They were, they were just very curious people who weren't indebted to that old way of thinking per se. And, and it and really... They weren't working really, for really, reputation. They were working for understanding. Yeah. Yeah, they were. They had. I think by virtue of the fact that they weren't trying to make a career out of science, they actually had the freedom to explore the ideas with the genuine luxury of being driven by that that desire for understanding. Because you mentioned earlier the feeling that you get when you finally understand something, and then that feeling when you realize you understand something nobody's ever understood. I, I it's. I, I don't know if there's even a word for like the level of. I can't even think of the word. It's not satisfaction so much. It's not, it's not bliss or anything, but it's just this real feeling of connectedness to the whole human project and to the, really the whole cosmos. There's something very... Uh, I like how you use articulation. I, like I imagine like a chiropractor, like setting the joints of a spine. Like I think that that's the feeling of when something snaps into place and all of a sudden it makes sense in a way that it never <sighs> did. But yeah. Yeah, that's totally it. That's totally it. So what kind of projects are you, uh, well, so I want to hear about this, the monastery that you put together and the path to that. And, you know, I, I understand, I think what inspired you to do that, but what was the nuts and bolts of, of making this happen. Hmm. The nuts and bolts, like, how did I do it? Yeah. Or, like, yeah. How, how did you do it? How did you organize the people and the resources to make this happen? <laughs> and then maybe uh, it'd be cool to hear about wh what, the, what is the, how do you set the tone for the atmosphere of a place that's conducive to this kind of playful imagination that's not hamstrung by, the rigors of producing an immediate output. How do you set the tone? Well, we have different conferences. So people come over and spend the whole week where we're whiteboarding things out and discussing things. And usually everyone who comes over has some sort of passion of their own. So they're going to give a presentation too and get, you know, the experience of hearing themselves explain it to people finally. <laughs> um, 
the tone's not that difficult to set, I think, because we've selected the people. Um, there's no profit over here. We're not making money. And in fact, this started literally from the moment I decided I need to work on this because it needs to be worked on. This is what's going to change the way we live. This is what's going to change how we have relationships. And I've seen some very beautiful moments in relationships. I would like to know that all of humanity is going to be collecting those things too. It's just far more important than anything else. And I made this leap of faith that I was just going to do it, but I wasn't expecting at the time to, to develop a physics monastery or anything. I was expecting, you know, I was kind of trapped in Asia at the time. I thought I was going to spend one more month dedicated just to figuring out the fine structure constant. And I was going to have maybe a 10% chance of figuring something out about the fine structure constant in that month. But I was going to spend every waking minute. I was going to sleep eight hours every night and wake up every waking minute, only think about that. I wasn't going to have a phone. I was only going to do that. And at the end of the month, I was going to not be able to pay rent and not have any more food money and was just going to die. But I was going to worry about that literally six hours before I was going to die. Until then, I was only going to work on the fine structure constant because I really knew that <clears throat> history has changed so many times already. So many levels of how we live in the world as humans, right? We have a huge fort from its technology today. We, we have seen the technology, so we also remember the impact, at least on some level. The things we're focused on using those technologies are just getting attention from each other. I'm, I can't even remember why we're trying to get attention from the mob. I, I really don't know why anybody wants the attention of the mob. <laughs> Maybe you've never had the attention of the mob. It's not really a good thing. That's not the thing to focus on. When you get to the point where you understand things like a theory of everything, understanding attention from others, like mob wise, would be obvious for the thing that you don't want. What will you want then? You want to be able to engage with more intimacy with the world and with the people that you engage with. You want to engage with conversations that take you to ideas that matter to you right? That feel important and change how you think of yourself and the world and give you new questions to now explore, right? It gets, that's why it's exciting when you discover a new connection. It also usually comes with, oh, well, then what about this and this and this and this, things you didn't think about ever before because you didn't have that connection. It, it took that connection to lead to those questions. Anyway, I forget what I'm even talking about anymore, but... <laughs> The setting up of an atmosphere where people can engage deeply in these ideas. Yeah, I just want to comment too, I th just to answer that question, I think the reason people want the mob is because it elevates you ideally into connection with people. You have the visibility, uh, your head is sticking up above the crowd so that you can interact with more interesting people. Like, my own experience is just that the more, okay. say, the more subscribers we build on our, our YouTube channel, the easier it is for me to find to, to ask someone to come on the show and talk to me that I've been wanting to talk to for a long time because they want that visibility and they think, oh, well, if these people are paying attention to you, well, then maybe I'm, you're worth paying attention to. And so do, there's do you something think sort of we, unavoidable. If we didn't have money anymore, they would still feel that way? I wonder if there wasn't a monetary pressure, how many people would still spend their time working? Like, I, I think that's some or, fraction. We're trying to get prestige, I was thinking. I think everyone's going to work if there's not money. If there's not money to stop you from doing the things you want to do, I don't know anybody who didn't have some ideas what they wanted to do when they were a kid. <laughs> yeah, but it might be different stuff. Like, it might be that, you, you know, people spend their time, like, woodworking mm -hmm. as opposed to working in a laboratory. Oh, well, I still think that's working. That's, that's uh, learning, too, you know? Sure, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, th I agree. I think people would definitely. I mean, that's the quick. What's the quickest way to snap yourself out of a depression or something is to take on a really hard task, right? And and bury yourself in it. And I think that's pretty self evident. I, I don't know that, but but the th this is always an interesting question when people talk about universal basic income. There's always this conservative perspective that oh well, people will just stop contributing to society. And I I think that's a deeply flawed understanding of the human psyche. I don't necessarily think that they would stop contributing to society. I think that like 
science is, is a craft that emerged at some point relatively recently. Do you agree with that? Mm -hmm. Do you th And so if science is something that emerged relatively recently, it's hard to disentangle it from the financial and social benefits that people got from it. And so I kind of think that there is a correlation that is causative there, where the reason that, let's say, you know, tribes 10,000 years ago weren't working on the fine structure constant or trying to develop steam engines had to do with their relationship to nature being first and foremost. And so I actually think that if you were to remove all of these trappings that pressurize us and incentivize us to move towards money and whatever that looks like in society, I have a feeling that everybody would just become artists. Like I think you, because you see this in people, they love to paint, they love to sing, they love to dance, they love to drum. And I think that if you were to remove all of these pressurized constraints and just let them do their own thing inside of small groups, I just think that everybody would return to beautiful crafts. Well, science being one of those crafts. I mean, literally trying to understand nature, like working on the fine structure constant, that's certainly in line with the generative spirit of art. You know, they, they, don't, uh, they don't call it a liberal arts education for nothing. I totally agree. I think one, learning to draw was one of the most important talents I ever invested in. And by that, I mean, when you, when you learn to draw, like say you're trying to do a pencil drawing of a photograph, but your goal is to make it to you look like a photograph. Okay. To do that, your brain has to literally pay attention to every detail in the photograph. Has to, has to try to come copy it and then figure out why you screwed it up and try again. But by the time you figure it out, by the time you get to the point where you can copy and reproduce something photograph level, uh, your brain now automatically pays attention to all of those details. It's trained itself. You spent the time training. So that and walking through nature, like you know, on a trail, your, your brain is the whole time engaging with the environment. That's what its activity is as you go. That Those trainings to pay attention to those cues instead of billboards <laughs> are really, really important. Because if you get stuck and you can only, if you're driving down the road and you only see billboards, but you, you see stay on the road, but you're literally paying attention to only billboards versus say the mountains behind, or you're literally in a different world, right? Your, your brain is processing a whole different set of cues and, and reinforcing which ones are important over and over. Anyway, again, and this is, this is part of learning to see, right? That we were talking about mm -hmm. earlier, right? What does that mean? It's like, you know, I think cognitive scientists originally thought that humans perceived things as they are, right? They see, you see an object over there. And I think it was only when they started to develop robots that they realized that humans were actually seeing basically tools. They were seeing what things did and they were like a chair, right? For instance, this stool thing over yeah, here, actually a chair, that yeah. thing that's fashioned over there with, you know, the nice uh, up and down and it's also a chair, but they share no real semblance to each other. And yet they're both chairs because of the function that they serve to us. And so much of the world is like that, where we, we see what things could be to us rather than them as they are. And so you, you kind of have to, you have to sort of retool your, your preconceptions of what things should be in their tool sense, maybe, in order to really see new connections for the first time. And that's mm -hmm. tricky. It's really tricky. It's very difficult. In fact, every time someone in history has figured out a way to do it, they become heroes of history. It's very, very tricky. So it's, it's not you're stupid if you can't do it. The best way to do it is invest practicing how they've done it before. Right. Read up on Newton, read up on Plato, read up on all the great minds. Even if you end up disagreeing with them, great. You disagree with their idea, not just with the end statement. Right. If you, if you go through the concept, you've trained your brain through the advantage of the way they've learned to see. And then you can discard it, but you still have the advantage of seeing that way. So it, it's it's really just collecting superpowers, reading the, the history of ideas. Right. Mm. And people, <laughs> too. Yeah, away. I've always been obsessed with people. Uh, artists too you know i uh, we do a lot of music also in addition to science and i've always been really obsessed with digging up really crummy bedroom recordings of some of my favorite artists you know i want to see 
the songs before they were these beautifully produced uh, things. Uh, I want to see how I want to see those steps. You know, I want to see what it yeah. goes into having uh, to yeah. to making something brilliant and transcendent because it never starts off that way. And because so you want to know how to do it yourself. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, and and everybody goes through it. Even the, these absolute heroes. They, they go through it. They have these formative moments with all of their creations where things don't add up and don't make sense and they have notes and they're contradictory. And, and, and yeah, I absolutely revel in finding these, these shards. Yeah, we've been going through some of the formative texts. We just bought all the old... Uh, the we actually both independently the same week got a copy of Euclid's Elements. <laughs> yeah, that's right. We brought him two copies. Of what? Euclid's Elements. Oh, like fantastic. he he was he was talking to somebody and he's like, yeah, I got this copy of Euclid's Elements, and I was like, what? No, I got that copy of Euclid's Elements, but it turned out that the copy that I had arrived, uh, I had ordered, had not arrived yet, and he had gotten it himself. <laughs> but I think that this is why we're so curious about how you built the physics monastery because this is clearly something that the world needs. The world needs more places where people can come together to think cleanly and peacefully at great depth about the things that fascinate them and drive them. And so how do you go from being in a room where you're like, okay, four weeks from now, I'm going to have to think about the fact that I'm going to starve to death to, yeah, I have this place in Utah where people come and try to figure out the nature miracle of the Miracle after miracle, miracle honestly. Um, a day before rent ran out, someone who I don't even know who was sent me just enough money for rent. And now I had another month to go, so I just kept going. And it just kept happening like that. Literally... Miracle after miracle. <laughs> Just deciding to do it somehow worked out. This is, it was a surprise, honestly, but it's still working out. And I'm not saying we're, we're thriving by any means. We're barely surviving, but we exist. And we're going to keep going until we can't. <laughs> and so what did you do after you said you were in Southeast Asia? You were in Thailand? I was in Thailand and then in uh, Vietnam. And so how did you get back to Utah? What was the, what was the arc of that? Uh, somebody flew me to um, Switzerland from there. And so I stayed with a friend in Switzerland for months and worked on the Planck constants. And then <clears throat> a friend in Israel that's really interested in this science bought me a plane ticket to come back to the United States. <laughs> and then we started doing this here since. And uh, you know, we've had some supporters just keep this place going and, the goal is to build it. We want to get to a much bigger place so we can have, you know, a much larger conversation with many different kinds of threads of conversations, you know, some biology conversations, the conscious conversations, coding conversations. There's lots of things to do, lots of experts to engage with. If those experts are there because they're trying to figure things out, not because they're trying to get a reputation, because mm. they literally just want to know. If you frame the puzzle differently for me, because I need to see it from a different way. Can anyone do that? And it's a very useful environment that way, I think. I think there's something really deeply encouraging and profound about this experience that you've had, which I, I, I've experienced to some extent since we started this project too, which is something like, if you are really, really passionate and excited about something, people will show up to support you in that. And I, I don't, I don't want to sound super woo about that. Or, and obviously people suffer all sorts of setbacks and it doesn't work out for a lot of people too, but there is something really interesting about how people want to support projects that they think are genuine and motivated by, and, and genuinely motivated, right? That aren't about getting ahead or getting, you know, more dollars in your wallet or a nicer house. Like I think when people see someone who, are, who is genuinely pursuing something that is its own end, they... They, they come out of the woodwork and, and to support that. And it's, it's really, really strange to, to be a part of that. And um, at some point, I crossed over that same threshold from worrying about, oh my God, how are we going to pay rent to, well, it hasn't been a problem yet somehow. Like, just keep going, you know? And uh, mm -hmm. it slowly kind of just works its way out of your concern space. And... Um, I don't know what, what what more I can say about that, except for it does appear to be a real thing that hap that I encounter in other people as well, who are working on these sort of projects. So uh, it's very well, interesting I mean, to hear. It's it's a big world with lots and lots of people, and honestly, people have the most valuable thing. Each person has consciousness, right? Whatever story they tell about the world, they got to the point where they're telling a story about the world. They're conscious. They have the ability to use consciousness 
for so many things. It's, it's just, have you guys, I, I haven't told you anything about what I've found so far, right? We're all just doing background stuff so far, but do you want to, yeah. Do you want to go to some of the ideas or we just want to do warm up ideas the whole way? <laughs> no, no, let's do it. I, the, the next thing that I wanted to ask you was what you figured out about the fine structure constant. So that's a good place. Oh, all right. So you, you guys are already versed. I've seen a few of your videos. So you know, obviously what the fine structure constant is and how important it is, right? And your viewers probably are quite familiar with how important that it is. I could always use a refresh. Constant. It's a dimensionless constant like pi. So it has a string of digits. We don't know it the way we know pi. We know pi geometrically, so I can give you an algorithm that will give you the string of digits for pi to how many ever digits you want. But we don't know the fine structure constant to too many digits. We know it from measurement. Now, what do I mean by it? it's a geometric number? It's dimensionless, and it shows up in the relationships of all the constants of nature. Pi does too, by the way. Pi shows up all over in there. But there's another one besides pi that we haven't told the geometric story for us. So we don't understand the fine structure constant in physics. We have it, we know it as a measurement, just like we don't understand the electron's charge or the electron's mass, right? We just know them from measurement. Do you know how it's measured? Which? The fine structure constant? Mm -hmm. well, actually, there's many different measurements and <laughs> what a different error bar on there. It's fun to play with, but what I wanna, what I wanna go into is, the values of the digits haven't been well if you there's a lot of people who like to play kind of a numerology game where they try to find a way to get close to the fine structure constant right to find some short arrangement of equations or elements of equations to get you too close to the fine structure constant and it's not a very interesting game unless you actually come about with, with a very short simple equation that gets you there somebody sent me an equation well sent me a blog where someone had noticed a short, simple equation that gets you really close. In fact, closer than people pay, publish a PhD where they have, uh, here's all the kind of numerology ways you try to get close to it. They don't really mean anything, but here's the closest we could get. And they get you, you know, five sometimes, three significant digits, four, five. But this one got six. It was more than I'd ever seen. That's not all of them. It needed to get like nine and 11 or something. But it got six. and the way it was written was a little bit weird to me, so I kind of just took the square root or the square, I can't remember which way they gave it to me, but I just kind of just rewrote it and then decided to put in the equation the actual value for the fine structure constant and just put a minus x to find what would this equation need to be modified by to get the, the full value, all the rest of the digits. And the value that popped out is the number I needed to modify the equation I already had was all the digits we knew of the plane mass. So the, you know, the mass gap um, problem in, in mathematics, we're wondering we got a hyperbolic space and there's a, there's a gap in the double sheet and hyperboloid, right? But the size of the gap determines the scaling parameter of a hyperbolic space. I don't know big, this. Size, huh? I, I don't know about this gap. Oh, um, I'm trying to explain. If you have a cone on cone, okay, so there's a cone that intersects, a cone on bottom, and there's a, a bowl on top that's a double sheeted hyperbola. There's a bowl on top and on bottom, so it's a split bowl, but they're connected at the back at infinity as assumed in hyperbolic space. And then there's a single sheeted hyperboloid that also goes around the cone on cone, but in one sheet, okay? It's kind of like uh, the shape of a, um, a power plant. The bowl on bowl, the gap between the bowls is the separation between the hyperbolic space. So if you push the bowls all the way together so the gap goes to zero, then the cone on cone goes all the way like that, flat and out the other way, right? But the limiting case, so no gap. And then you have a hyperbolic space that kind of looks like a sphere <laughs> with hyperbolic rules. If you give yourself a gap, then that cone on cone ratio, your X versus Y scaling parameter ratio changes, right? And all hyperbolic spaces could be picked by just picking different ratios in, in that. So there's an actual gap in hyperbolic space, the hyperbolic space we find ourselves in that's been picked by nature and we don't know why, okay? So there's this mass gap. This is, well, here we had, I had a hyperbolic 
just an equation that was for a hyperbolic equation, just a hyperbolic equation that needed to be modified with a mass gap equal to the Planck mass. I should have been more excited about this. First, I was just excited that I had a way to get all the way to the fine structure constant and use it accurately and so on. And I could connect it for all the constants of nature and so on, and it worked too. So it was a number that was really working. But it comes with three other siblings. It's an equation that, so if you set up this equation, set it equal to zero, for example, there'll be four roots. So there's four players that you can use in the same equation to do the same thing, but they're completely different numbers. Make sense? So um, I didn't pay attention to the other three roots for, for over a year at first. I was doing everything I could from that number, but eventually I realized, hey, if I'm using this constant to look into all these other constants of nature, then its siblings have to play a central role too. So then I just backed up and tried to look at all the algebra of all four siblings, all four fine structure constants, you might call it, and found right away that they're talking about a domain. So what does the shape look like in this hyperbolic space is dividing up? Well, to answer that question, you would look at the quadrants of the balance. What, what are they quadranting? And to get the quadrants, you look at the roots of, this, of the equation and square them all and add them together. Or you could, instead of quadrants, in this case, when you do that, you get negative four pi. So we're getting a projective sphere that we're dividing up. When we take the same solutions, so j1 times j2, j2, three times j4, so we multiply them together. Instead of squaring them first and adding them, we're just gonna multiply them. Then we get two pi. So these roots are extremely circular, spherical. They're, they're dividing up a sphere, they're producing a circle, and their sum is, a z, is zero, of course, they're making a balance. Of course, and I looked further and I found that they also have a quaternion logic. So these roots are maintained under quaternion logic. So they give us a quaternion algebra, which you know gives us quantum mechanics connection. Uh, then I noticed that, well, I mean, I'm jumping a lot of steps, of course, here. The exciting part is when I looked at these basic equations we have, in fact, I have, yeah, here we go. I'll hold this up here. There we go. So these three equations alone kind of stipulate the algebraic connections of that hyperbolic space. And so what is, what is the je constant? The je is the solution to the hyperbolic equation. So the hyperbolic equation is one over x plus x plus x cubed over two pi. And we set that equal to um, the cone on cone structure with i to the i to the negative pi over two rotation, and then minus a gap, so some magnitude. And then we put in the magnitude of the gap, we put the Planck mass. Um, the solutions to that structure are j1 and j2 and j3 and j4. So four simultaneous solutions. Yeah. Okay, when, when we take the subsets, so I showed you the equations where we take all four of the j's together and see what they're doing structurally. But you could ask, well, what happens when you look at a subset? What are the substructures doing? And the interesting substructures are the ones that give us real outputs. So j1 and j2 are both real numbers. They're one-dimensional numbers. And three and four are two-dimensional numbers. They have a complex part. So when you combine them into subsets of pairs and triplets, which pairs and triplets give you a real output? Well, it turns out all the possible real output pairs and triplets are the sub partitionings for all the constants in nature here. By which I mean, when I take that one hyperbolic equation for dividing up a sphere, we're just quadrants up a sphere, and these are gonna be all the, the sub ways of dividing up those, so the partial sets for dividing internally in that sphere. Five possible ways, actually. Then we get the constants in nature Expressing, may I back up? We're searching for a pattern in the constants of nature. We're searching for an understanding of those constants. We've got a system here where I'm saying it's a partition set made of two parts, two piece players, an external part and an internal part. The internal part for every single constant always internally wraps over on the same exact internal boundaries. So we have fixed internal boundaries for the whole set of the constants, for all the expressions. The external boundaries, the external expression depends on the on the dimensions of the constant itself. So the speed of light, we have we have length, we have time, right? Length divided by time or the dimensions. So it's a relationship that's the division is important, that specific relationship. 
when we scour all of those constants and try to put them together in you know, tables and lists, the only way we can really compare the constants is by comparing them dimension-wise. So we have hundreds of constants of nature that we've measured, um, listed at CODATA and NIST. And the comparisons to make between them have to be between their dimensions. I mean, the only things that are listed are the, the string of digits, the powers, and the dimensions. So when you compare all the dimensions, you're looking for some sort of pattern to come out and geometrically tell you what's the anchor, what's the rule that sets these, these uh, values as they are. When we have our two-piece system and the right hand or the, the internal piece has the scaling parameter of the Planck length times by the Planck mass divided by the Planck charge squared, which turns out really close to one times 10 to the negative seven. But when that's a scaling parameter, we get this whole pattern. I don't know if you've seen it yet, but we get this whole pattern that pops out, which makes it start to become really interesting. At that specific scale, we get an actual structure now in all the constants of nature. We're, we're not saying we're done figuring that out, but we're certainly honing in on understanding what this structural component, what all these different clues are talking about. For example, there's, I don't know, we got... And by structured, well, by the way, do you just, you mean a, a, a relational system? Yes, it's a, a division system. So it's a set of boundaries, breaking apart into different numbers of things, rotating on different scales of actions that are all closed together like a manifold. And that system has many different unique expressions in it, right? You can go to many different parts of it, find the same expressions repeated many places. But in total, there's many unique expressions in there. And those are the, the things we're trying to model and the things we're trying to understand. And those are the things that we've gotten from the measurements we call the constants of nature. So giving a story, any story, for the constants of nature is really, really, really important, right? We need to understand what they actually are. Right now in physics, we're going forward in our projection. We're trying to imagine a construction to frame the world in and make sense of things. And that's a good, noble goal. But we're at a stage in history where we have data points to take advantage of. We have this whole collection of data points that we should be directly looking at the pattern for in them. Right? I mean, literally, that's what the constants of nature are. Um, they're the hardest earned measured data points about what reality is so far, right? That's, those are the gemstones of science. That's the things we've worked the hardest for. And we don't know them perfectly, but they're still the gemstones of science because they each tell us some degree of freedom in the real world that currently no human alive is understanding. Some aspect of the real world that we're not getting right when we think about the world yet. And all the constants of nature are, are cues to that, every single one. And maybe you need to get just one more thing right and suddenly all those will make sense. Or maybe you have to get all, each one has to be some new thing you have to reframe. We don't know until we get there. There's one more thing that I wanted to tell you about, and that is our very first in-person event. It is Demysticon 2024, and it is happening in Austin, Texas, April 7th and 8th to coincide with the total solar eclipse. We're going to get a chance to get together in person and talk about all of the big questions that you have while watching and see all the talks in person, live, for the very first time. Tickets are up here. If you cannot attend because Austin is just too difficult to get to, we are also selling tickets to attend the virtual event. And so come on over, check that out, and we hope to see you in Austin. Here we're trying to chase that down. And why? We're trying to then use the structural components to find a way to code their actions on purpose. We want to be able to do chemistry via coding. And uh, I believe it's totally possible to do that. I know there's different people in history like Newton who have dedicated the latter stages of their life to trying to figure things like that. And there's a whole history of alchemy, but I don't think what I'm talking about is necessarily a magic thing. It's a, it's a matter of figuring things out. Reality is there to be figured out. The periodic table of elements is a structural component of reality on some level there to be figured out. When we do figure those sorts of things out about the world, there's so many more blessings to come. Blessings is mean, not the best word. There's so many more revelations to come that change the world you're in, that change how it feels just to exist, right? That free you into a world that doesn't need to focus on the things that don't make you feel good anymore. <laughs> and there's a lot of loose talking there, but my point is at this stage here at the Physics Monastery, what we're, what we're doing is we're focusing directly on the constants of nature. We're asking every question we can. We're using Wolfram Alpha, by the way. So if anyone's not been introduced to Wolfram Alpha, it's a super wonderful tool. It's a superpower. We're using Wolfram Alpha to try to ask 
every possible question we can in comparison, in relationship between the different constants to get more information. And the process has been fantastically, fantastically productive so far. So I know there's a, a lot of interest around the world in trying to do things like this. Um, my goal isn't necessarily to, to get a crowd. My, my goal is to get people to realize they can individually ask these questions about the world themselves. I'm not professing some magical truth. I'm trying to get us all to look back on the goal, on the track. We have data points about reality that we worked really hard for. Let's focus on making sense of those because there has to be a story for why the electron has its mass. There has to be. If you believe there's a God that made a universe, then that God would understand why he made the electron have the mass that it has. There would be a reason for it. If you don't think there's a God, there still has to be a reason for the re for why the electron has its mass. It, it structurally does something that we're not currently aware of, right? That feature's not just made up. It's not just some scientist saying it's there. It's testably around the world. Everyone agrees on these features, <laughs> the best we can measure so far. Making sense of them is going to free us to a different kind of being. We said earlier, almost every other creature in the world busies its entire existence with survival. Right, right. Maybe mating as part of survival, but that's what it's really caught up with. And humans have this unique distinction where we've figured out other things to do. We've had the fortune to be able to think other ways and organize in other ways so that we're not just focusing on survival. Now, you might argue that people now monetize by trying to get people to think more like being in the survival mode or, you know, more feel threatened than you really are. But not all, all of us are there anymore, and humanity has even further to go. We have a future where people don't think through survival mode. People think through creative mode, where they're trying literally to enhance the way their brain can come up with ideas, because creative thought becomes the currency of the future. If, if resources don't matter, if we have replicators, if money doesn't matter, the ability to think limits what you can do, and only. <laughs> When we're talking about this uh, cone on cone that's surrounded by this hyperbolic surface, mm -hmm. is that derive? Do you derive that from something? Or do you approximate it? Is this some starting point that is known? Ask me again. I'm not quite sure what you're asking. Well, it seems like you're deriving your mathematics from this structure of the the bowl on bowl surrounded by hyperbolic, hyperbolic space. Yeah. yeah, and is and this like a reference to non-Euclidean geometry and, and space-time? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's hyperbolic space, four-dimensional, traditional four-dimensional hyperbolic space. But when you have a hyperbolic space, you still have to, you have to pick a scaling parameter of your hyperbolic space, because you could pick any scale. They all would count as a hyperbolic space, right? So you have to pick one. The surprise really is that nature picked a specific one, and we have no idea why. Yeah. No idea why. There's not even an element to a story for what that's there for yet. So, and, so and, I mean, and, we're and developing like, a story around that, but whether we're right or wrong, we're investigating it. So, go ahead. And and so the answer to that question, whatever it might be, it seems like you imagine that it's a relational answer. Like you see these patterns, and the goal is to derive very simple equations from which these constants fall out. Something like that. Uh, is is that reasonable that you're looking for a relational answer? In other words. What does an answer to that question look like? Well, I'm not looking for a relational. I want a, a specific as answer as possible. Literally, I want an internal clockwork, right? I want to know at what scale do things break up and in what way? How many pieces do you break up on this scale and what shape are you? How many pieces do you break up on this scale and what shape are you? And so on until the picture is complete and everything's fit together. No matter how many pieces, how many gears are in the system, I want, to I want to understand all the gears and how I could change the interplay of those gears to do something different and flip from this atom to this atom and so on, right? I want to understand the things that nature is currently doing. And yeah, I'm not saying I'm there, but I'm going. <laughs> no, this is very much a project that we're interested in as well. Uh, I'm, I'm just trying to get at the quantitative nature of it because <clears throat> you seem to be very mathematically oriented. I am comfortable with mathematics, but when I'm trying to ask these questions about the universe, I am thinking more in terms of materials. Like, what okay. what materials could affect these? What materials could explain these equations? Right? Because I had this really 
profound experience when I was in grad school and I was working in these harmonic systems. I worked with an AFM, which is basically all your mathematics is harmonic. And I also was like simultaneously teaching this basic kind of physics class um, one <coughs> summer. And I just was struck by looking at the atom as a harmonic resonator. And I, I started to just really think about, hey, what if it's not just like a harmonic resonator? What if it actually is a harmonic resonator? Mm -hmm. And so when I think about trying to make sense of why these, where these constants come from, I think about the basic material constants that we see in material science too, you know, uh, Young's modulus, things like this, these things that actually scale the deformability of those materials and so forth. And so I'm very much always thinking about fundamental physics in terms of material science. Like this is why of I was contrasting that because it seems like you're thinking about it more relationally in terms of seeing these patterns that play out in the dynamics and how they relate to one another and how they could be simplified. Yeah, um, I'm interested in finding the logic. And to find the logic, I need to understand the logical components and how they connect. They have yeah. to all be logical pieces simultaneously, right? They all have to coherently be logical pieces, which is a big clue. Every Every piece of logic that must exist in a system different than another piece helps you understand how to frame the system in a different way. So, yeah. Yeah, I like, what, I like how you put it that you're looking for the co kind of the underlying code uh, of physical reality, um, which is a very, uh, it's a very interesting project. It lends itself to, you know, if code is fundamental, it lends itself to a very interesting worldview, uh, which is in some sense very non material. Would you, would you agree with that? Not yet. Go further. Let me see where you're going. Well, if 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 the foundations of reality are fundamentally mathematical, then mm -hmm. do you not end up at a simulation hypothesis? I don't necessarily think so. I don't okay. refute a simulation hypothesis because code and logic can also be understood entirely geometrically. So it could just be that there's a logic to reality because there's a geometry to reality, right? And on that level, it's a different level of thinking about it. They could all be true, right? But the geometry level to me feels more like a, it's a physical thing. It has a geometry, a shape. Even if we're just talking about the way a wave dances about, still it's a physical thing to me. Now this word geometry doesn't mean what it used to though. That's what's really uh, perplexing sure. and, and sort of gets in the way of, of me making the leap from geometry to material reality because you know with the introduction of non-euclidean geometry in the 20th century geometry no longer means just the topology of material objects of bodies right let's say mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. so we have the ability to think about relationships in a geometrical sense as opposed to fundamental bodies themselves and just mapping their contours let's say which is kind of the mm -hmm. fundamental yeah. project and so, I mean, materialism, if I can put an ism on it, had a heyday of about 50 years, as far as I can tell, where Descartes came around and he was like, it's the plenum, it's the vortices, it's the surfaces. And it was a wildly popular idea. And then within 50 years, Newton basically wrote the Principia to take Descartes down, as far as I can tell. Because he's preoccupied almost entirely in the Principia with demonstrating that the Cartesian plenum is physically impossible. And what's crazy is that he concludes the, the entire work without having... He, he mathematizes the relationships. He comes up with this universal constant. But he doesn't have a cause for gravity. And then when he writes optics, like 20 years later almost, he adds an appendix to optics, which is the... Or no, I think it's the, the second edition of the Principia, which is the general scolium, where he goes through and he like kind of puts context onto all of the ideas that he had in the Principia. And he's like, I have parameterized the mathematics. I make no hypothesis about the cause of it. And furthermore, it is not the job of the experimental philosopher to seek cause. Maybe one day it will be when we have enough data. But right now, we're still in the data gathering stage. And I feel like that was kind of the death knell for a, uh, for a search for a material foundation for reality because Newton's mathematics allowed people to focus exclusively on forces and all of this abstract 
m- motion without really having to spend too much time being like, well, well ho- ho- hold on a second. How is that motion being <coughs> transmitted? And what I see now is this further development into progressively more unreal physical theories. More abstract. No, literally more unreal. Like, I think that mathematics isn't real. I think that mathematics is an idea that... Give me, dis- give me an example of an unreal m- unreal physics. Like an imaginary... Like, an, or like, like quaternions. Like, quaternions, as far as I can tell, are a mathematical relationship that Hamilton derived on the back of the weird behavior of imaginary numbers. And he kept, like, moving things around until he came up with a mathematical relationship that held in this new sort of imaginary geometry. Is that, would you, would you accept that as a rough thing? Yeah, but it's, it's important to, to note that the mathematical relation he was trying to hold is that he wanted the mathematical operations, he wanted a whole closed division algebra to be doable, right? The rules of a division algebra, are they doable on any other level of, of uh, uh, framing things? And he found you can't do it in three dimensions, but you can on four. Yeah, but yeah. And so, so you feel that that's unreal because maybe I'm guessing it doesn't feel like it gives you any new depth of access to what's going on. Is that what you mean by unreal? I mean that perhaps, perhaps, and perhaps it's my enumeracy, right? Like maybe if I was more numerate and I had a more immediate grasp of... I don't think you mean unreal. I think you just mean immaterial. But that's what I mean by real. I think that real things are material things. And I think that that's an important... Yeah, I, I hate this word real, uh, especially since we're talking mathematics and this can get confusing. But I think you're talking about material, right? Like I think bodies he, in motion. Which So like in my mind, if I'm like, that is a real thing, it is bodies in motion. Because the way that things become real, like an idea is not real. The idea becomes real when I'm like, I have an idea for a birdhouse and I go and I collect the materials and I arrange them in the shape of a birdhouse and I put it outside and a bird moves in. I'm like, I have taken something that is unreal and I have transformed it into the real. And so as long as, and I think that mathematics has a, has the ability to completely disconnect from what I say, what I, what I mean when I say real, from the material, because you can have something that is theoretically possible, theoretically consistent, logically holds together, but there is no there is no branch point along which you can trace it back to material reality. And I feel like a lot like I feel like uh quantum field theory is kind of like that where it has this massive void at it because at some point you have to go from a field to a thing, but the field is not the thing. And like I came across this in graduate school because I studied uh, the electron transport chain in bacteria. And I was writing my dissertation and I kept talking about like charge on these molecules. And I was like, what the fuck is charge? And I go to my boss and he's like, well, it's, it's, he doesn't, he doesn't know. And I'm working with an electrical engineering lab and he's like, they know. And I'm like, okay, great. And so I go to the electrical engineering lab and they like, they have an equation that they can give me. And I'm like, yeah, but what does that mean? Like what is happening to the molecule when it's charged? And they're like, well, these are the things that it can do once it's charged. And I'm like, okay, but what has happened to it? And there's just, there's just a blank stare of like, what are you stupid? Like it's charged. Yeah, I had the same same response. I think most people do. I think usually the teachers are embarrassed to dr- address your real question there and to admit that they just don't know, right? That's somehow embarrassing to not know, but nobody knows, so. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's like a rude question well, to ask. it's incredible that you can not know that and still be so functional, right? You can still be so technologically proficient. And so it, oftentimes, after instead of I don't know, it's like it doesn't matter, right? Yeah. But, yeah, they trivialized the question, but I think that question process is the gold. And I, Newton may have been right, because back then, they had just really gotten good at measuring things. Measuring was kind of a new invention. That's the superpower of consciousness. Instead of making things up entirely or just trying to outwill people by demanding your story is right, and that's how it becomes right, now we measure things, completely different standard of authority, right? But from all those new measurements, which we needed to engage in, he was right, we need to now take measurements, people. We have the ability to do this. We know it needs to be done. We don't know what features we're missing. Let's go measure. But 
you know, it's not like we expect, but we've been measuring for a while and we have all kinds of periodic table of elements. We think that's done, right? In fact, there's a whole bunch of ones at the end there that we've filled in that we haven't measured that we think could fill the rest of the symmetry. So we think there's more, but they're not yet to be found on Earth. All right, but we've got all the constant nature of measurements. It's time to get back to making mechanical sense of the physical expressions that show up in the world. They're mm. physical expressions. <laughs> We're measuring them, right? So that, that's where I'm at. I think everybody should use their best conscious ability to, to creatively engage in figuring that out, no matter which way that takes them. This is, this is how we're going. Good, good. Yeah, good. So that's, that's exactly the project that we're in. And so I want, I want to understand how simplifying the dynamical expressions and these higher order abstractions points us in the direction of making material sense of fundamental reality. And, I, and I, I'm not sure that I'm there yet. And, and maybe you can hold my yeah, hand. Yeah, of course not, because we, we don't have an actual framing. So in mathematics, we have simple single action equations, like for gravity, for electrostatic repulsion, whatever. We have little pieces of equations we'll put together, but we, we don't have at any level that you get to a class where all of a sudden all those equations are fit together for you, right? They're just piecemeal. And that's our level of understanding so far. The, the goal, when you find not just a geometric way to express a constant of nature, the goal is not just to get one, but to get the whole set so that you can see how all of them are connecting. If you understand how all of them are connecting, then you start to get the actual boundaries, the pieces of the geometry to get to fill in and draw and actually see what's going on. And it's not until you can conceive it that you can see it. No matter how it's right in front of us the whole time, we have to be able to conceive it right. And instead of trying to conceive it right by being geniuses, we've given that a try. We're not geniuses enough. The best thing to do is to focus on the actual data points and find the symmetries, the logic held in there, right? That's the clues that we need to make sense of at the end anyway. So yeah, if that were... So it's, it's kind of like our desks are too cluttered to really see the, the connections. And, and so finding these relational patterns allows us to streamline what's important here and how it relates to one another so that maybe we can have a shot at least of getting... A, a sensible picture of that fundamental physical reality. Yeah, exactly. I understand you properly. Exactly. Exactly. And and so we're not at the end stage, but I'm imagining that with the end stage, you would be able to engage with the mathematics in a delightful way, not a oh, this is scary. What is this saying? It would be empowering to have each one of those say, oh, well, then I could do this. It would it would turn into a different conversation. We're not at that stage right now, and mathematics is frustrating for everybody in the world right now because whatever threshold you're at. You look at the rest of it, like, I have no idea how to do the rest of that. I, I'm not smart enough for that. And all the stuff that you've already figured out seems like, well, anybody could figure that out. <laughs> yeah. So it's this tricky thing because we haven't gotten to a place where things actually fully frame together. We're not done in our conscious evolution. Um, that's why we're looking for this. We want to know what logic did nature pick. It has logic constructing all of its properties. So if you know that logic, then you know that the logical operation you could use in a computer. And if you build your computers just from those logical operations, now you're literally engaging with the substrates of physical reality to do your computing, to make your things, to turn into other things, to take energy out of it. I mean, <laughs> it's a whole different level of living and it may still be a hundred years away, maybe 500 or a thousand years away. So what I'm feeling like if we focus on this, if we really make it our effort, this could be 20 years away. It's a matter of understanding the world in a way we haven't done it. And whenever that's the game, you can always be just one fathom away. <laughs> so when it comes to seeking this understanding and working at it from a mathematical sense, it seems to me that if the foundation is geometrical, then if you had a geometry for some fundamental unit, the most fundamental useful unit, then you could derive the equation from the relationship of many of those fundamental units. Is that something that you're working on? Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. And so what do you have a sense for what that, that unit is for you? Well, I mean, so I wasn't trying to generate the unit. My, my goal was to back into it, right? But the, what I've backed into so far, and I'm pretty sure this part's right, what details are exactly wrong from here out, is that the fundamental unit looks like this. Is that a <laughs> Oh, that's crazy. We were at Brian Keating's house, and Brian Keating had that thing on his table. What is that? This is a hyperbolic figure eight knot. 
We're anyway. actually at his office, not his house. Sorry, I imagine <laughs> that he, I imagine that he only exists inside of his office. We're, we're not quite that good of friends <laughs> yet. All right, so well, let, let's back up a little bit. In geometry, there's this concept of manifold, right? It's a thing that can have boundaries without edges. Let's say, like a, a torus. We can take a, a you know, make a flat sheet of paper and wrap it together and tape one of its edges together, get rid of its edges. And then if it was stretchy, you could take the two circles and tape them together. And now it's a shape that has boundaries, right? It has a surface boundary, but it doesn't have edges. Okay. Well, there are the simplest possible three-dimensional or three-manifold that you can have is called the Gieskin manifold. And imagine you, you, for, you formed a Gieskin manifold with some random wave interactions that just came together just right to form it. It's not until you double walled it, double covered it, that it would become stabilized and wouldn't just dissipate immediately after forming it. Okay, so in order to, to stabilize it, you'd have to double up on it. And when we double cover the Gieske manifold, we get exactly the hyperbolic figure eight knot. So I think the internal structure of hyperbolic space is the smallest possible knot you can make in hyperbolic geometry. And the external expression, that knot being formed means as in, from the outside is a cutoff region where nothing from the outside ever gets to go inside it. So the domain gets divided internally and externally. And the external expression of this internal cutoff in the hyperbolic figure eight knot is what I think is the N hypersphere of maximal volume. Interestingly, these things are opposites in volume. So the minimal possible volume complement you can have in hyperbolic space is the hyperbolic figure eight knot. And the maximal volume structure, volumetric structure you can have is the N hypersphere of maximal volume. I think literally, one creation of a hyperbolic figure eight knot also externally creates the maximal, the n sphere of hyper of max. Sorry, the n sphere of hypersphere of maximal volume. There we go. Like and, it, it's basically like the the what's the the helio? What's the the surface of the sun that's out at the heliopause called? Heliosphere. The I don't know. I, I, uh, helio sheath. The helio sheath. So it's basically like you have the 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 um. Hyperbolic knot would be the sun, and then this like outer larger surface of it would be the other object that I can't remember the name of. What would be the universe? So this this balance would be creating the smallest possible balanceable universe. And if you imagine any possible scales are available, we're in a void. We'll start out in a void that's got infinite expanse. We'll just give it that, okay? I don't know why it's there, but we'll start out with infinite expanse. But what this expanse is doing is just supporting random waves. There's just random noise everywhere in the expanse and go. But then we ask, if these random waves came together in certain ways, you could get certain interesting things to happen. What's the smallest possible way you could get an interesting thing to happen such that once it happens, it continues to happen, it persists and over. So what's the smallest way to lock up any size of this infinite void into a persistently dividing domain that continues its characteristics? That's the question. And in geometry, it turns out to be the hyperbolic figure eight knot, which looks from the concepts of nature may be the story in reality also. So I find this extremely interesting, extremely exciting. But if it's true, it means the external structure, all the parts that the N hypersphere of max volume breaks up into, all the ways those boundaries fit together and twist and so on, those will all become available features for us to manipulate and better understand the world. Anyway. Can you give me a more intuitive understanding of the N hypersphere of maximal volume? Uh, Yes, let's, well, I can try. <laughs> Excellent. That's I'm still I can developing <laughs> this, so let me give you the best impression that I have come to so far. So in, in general, as we go out to the largest scale, it's going to be look just like a boring sphere, a normal boring sphere on its external projection. But internally, it has some structure that continues to go on, on that keeps that out to some, it's not fi- infinite, by the way, it's finite, to that finite domain being balanced. Inside, we have to go from being a three-dimensional boring sphere to a four-dimensional hypersphere somewhere. As we go towards the center of the sphere, we have to change our construction from looking from three-dimensional sphere to a four-dimensional hypersphere. And there's a map in mathematics that does that, that converts from the three-sphere to a four-hypersphere. It's called the Hopf map, right? Have you heard of this? The Hopf vibrations and so forth, yes. Yes, yeah, the hop vibrations, the hop map, completely that. 
I, so I, I haven't. Getting getting a visual of the the hypersphere would would mean having a completely in, integrated visual of this Hopf map, and the Hopf map divides the whole domain into a whole bunch of rings, and all the rings are interlinked once with all the other rings. This is a key feature element. So there's a connection that maintains simply between everything, but it divides everything into different sizes of rings as it restructures the whole system. So uh, I don't have a full picture there. I want an animation available uh, eventually, if I can get to the point where I can code it and get to the point where I have all these degrees of freedom coded to animate all of that structure, then I'll be completely satisfied, I think. But that's that's kind of where we're going. So in general, if you zoom really far out, it looks like a sphere, a normal boring sphere. But if you zoom in towards the center, it gets all kinds of interesting character, all this hop construction. Yeah. Uh, it's been a while since I looked, but uh, you, you know Eric Weinstein, I'm sure. He, he uh -huh. has a website where he has attempted to anim animate some of these different topologies that, that might be worth checking out. Um, yeah, they're fantastic, actually. There's, there's other people who have followed up that have gone really into depth for uh, animation. But the animations they're doing are, are still one-dimensional reduced compared to the structure we're really trying to map there. They're given a, a, a shadow analogy and then you know, going up for there to try to help you picture it. It's not the full picture, but it certainly will help. Yeah. Okay, so this is a little bit of a shift. Is there uh -huh. something that you wanted to ask? Take it away. Oh, so in your TED Talk, you used this flatland analogy where you have a horizon and there's all these colors on the horizon and it seems like it's this uncausal randomness that you can kind of look at, but you can't make any predictions. And you're like, okay, so if we change and we add a dimension suddenly we can see that what it is is the reason for the colors on the horizon is that you have these balls moving on a surface and there's a transect and as the balls cross the transect you see the color and you're like if the flatlanders could imagine this they could map it onto their world and i always have a hard time with i understand what you're saying i understand what everybody is saying when they say that but i'm like the flatlander could never draw it in a way that made sense because all of those motions would be impossible in flatland because there yeah, wouldn't would never be relevant to the way it's engaged at all it wouldn't have any of the fundamentals of that okay I, well sure. i'm just i'm just imagining like somebody in flat like somebody in flatland can't have a piece of paper and a pen to even like draw to even draw something yeah, well, remember in Edward Abbott's book in Flatland, the, the character was actually taken out of Flatland at one point and got to see the rest from above. So he still did see it somehow. <laughs> he had the ability to engage, he just hadn't. So I guess that he was trying to make that claim, at least in the book, I guess. But yeah, I get your point. <laughs> but, right, but as a biologist... It's a very maddening thing to try to comprehend. Uh, actually, the, the person who gave me the book Flatland uh, dropped out of college the next day or something. I think he'd had it. He, he was at the at the ends of his wit with these things. Um, that, yeah, that was many, many years ago. Okay, I mean, so this is this is perhaps my limitation as somebody who's been trained in biology, but like whenever people talk about consciousness and they're like, you know, mm -hmm. consciousness is so crazy and we can't understand it. And I'm like, it's it's the only way in which cells can do stuff. And I don't think that you can isolate life and consciousness where maybe there's maybe life predates cells but by the time that you have cells you must have consciousness because the cell must be consciously aware of its environment in order to do all of the things that it needs to do in order to survive a cell that can't, doesn't have consciousness can't survive and so obviously it's this quantity that is inherent to the material organization of like fats and amino acids and carbohydrates and whatever you mean quality that, not quantity huh? this quality right you said this quantity yeah yeah okay fine quality so it is a quality of these things interacting. And so we have consciousness that is definitely more complex than the consciousness of a bacterium, but it's the same quality that's just been iterated over a long enough period of time. And so when we start to talk about like fourth dimensions, fifth dimensions, you talk about 11 dimensions, I immediately I'm like, I make it make it real for me. Make it something that relates to the biological reality, to the material reality. 
And I struggle with being able to map that because I'm like, look, comprehension depends on the organization of our structures. And you can, you know, people do DMT and they see crazy hyperbolic geometry. And like the Quality Research Institute is working on figuring out the significance of that for understanding consciousness and understanding like how we think and and what experience. Some people do are universally. Uh, With DMT? Yeah. Uh, universal. Like it, once you universal. take DMT like to a sufficiently DMT. high dose, you basically enter into this hyperbolic ge- geometry universe with lots of. Uh, it's not quite universal, but it's damn near. It's it's in the ninetieth ninety percentile and so forth. It's kind of remarkable. It's one of the only psychedelics that has a shared experience by its users. Uh, hmm. I don't know if that's either here nor there. I didn't mean to. No, totally... I think that that's. I think that that's. I, I like the clarification is important. I thought it was more. But, common than what, that. but who who cares about GMT? Where I'm like, okay, so there's something weird that people can see when they take DMT. I've never taken DMT, and so for me, it's this thing that exists like far outside of my imagination. And so I'm preoccupied by what it means to have eleven dimensions that we visualize or animate when we live in a universe where we don't have the hardware to actually be able to imagine what that is, the same way that somebody who lives in Flatland, for the sake of a fictional book, can be taken out and can experience it. But if there actually was a Flatland, and you took that person out of Flatland, they wouldn't, you couldn't actually take them out and let them see. Because (laughs) their entire evolutionary process... I might suggest that the evolution of consciousness is also the evolution of sight. It's really just a matter of giving him the framing of a different world that's acceptable, and then he can see. But until he has that framing, no, he can't. But the same thing applies to us. You might argue that we don't have the ability to actually see three dimensions. We always only see two flat dimensional pictures, and we just put it together to make things up, but we're not ever seeing three dimensions, right? But we have the ability to evolve beyond what what we see and conceive even further. Now, what, does it apply when we go to the higher dimensions? I don't know. We're not done with the picture. But the goal is to get to a point where we're actually conceiving the rest in a way that's comfortable, empowering, right? Um, to, to touch base with the physical aspects of it. In, in the picture that we're at right now, it's no longer 11 dimensions, by the way. 11 dimensions was a beautiful model for giving you the degrees of freedom you needed for gravity. But the problem with that picture is in order to get that degree of freedom, you had to have all these boundaries, these spheres created but no reason. And they couldn't find a reason to create them. They did, they're, they're more of a problem than the thing you were trying to solve. I'm so, I'm so relieved to hear you say that. Okay. Well, <clears throat> yeah, well, I'm never trying to claim the truth. I'm after the truth. Yeah, so it's beautiful. Ideas and keep going. But the goal of what there was to realize when you have that model, you have a density explanation for gravity that's fantastic, but you had all these boundaries to make sense of somehow. And then you discover what a, a, a manifold is. It's a thing that has boundaries where all of the edges that stick out are accounted for. They're all touching somewhere else, right? And so they're all, it's a logic where all the boundaries make sense versus the logic system that I had where all the boundaries don't make sense, <laughs> right? Anyway, that's uh, the, the, the physical touch here is that the five dimensions we're talking about, sp- uh, time, space, charge, mass, and temperature, these are all the five dimensions that you can measure. They are the measurable things in the world. Everything else we measure, like velocity, is just made up of some of those. Everything else we measure is made up of only those five dimensions. Can, can, you, can you say them again one more time? You said them too fast. Time, space, charge, mass, and temperature. Every concept of nature is composed of just those five dimensions. Sometimes you square charge and divide it by time cubed, right? But it's still just those five dimensions. Do you think it's possible to reduce those concepts to bodies in motion? Whether it's mm-hmm. structures of the atom or something else, is it, is it mm-hmm. possible that we will arrive at some very simple idea that where each one of those features falls out as the result of some materials in motion? I see this all as basically a partition theory. So a a theory that describes how things break apart and therefore invent boundaries and the breaking and so on. But that's things in motion. That's boundaries pushing against boundaries. And you can call them things while they're boundaries. Like it's a a whirlwind, a tornado that is a thing while it's going, right? (laughs) Well, I think that's the best way to define what a body is, is Mm -hmm. as having a boundary that separates the inside from the outside. and. Mm-hmm. Fundamentally, I mean, the most basic rule in physics I can think of is you can't have two bodies in the same place at the same time. 
right? They're going to knock each other out of the way or deform or, or, or just de be destroyed or something. Right. And, and yeah. so I can, I can certainly relate to that. Uh, I, I'm just, I'm still circling around how this leads us back to understanding the fun, how the, how these small scale bodies are producing the phenomena that we observe, you know, charge, mass. Mm, okay. Well, the next step. So when we have these five ingredients of the world, and they give us all the measurable thing kinds, but you have to, you know, sometimes it's squared and cubed or whatever. They give us all the measurable kinds. They also come, each concept of nature comes with its own equation in physics, an action that it's scaling, right? It's the scaling parameter for that action. Um, <sighs> well, like in elastic mechanics, stiffness scales the deformation, let's say. And how much force or effort you need to put into deforming it is going to be scaled by the stiffness. You know, this is an easy, yeah, so, very basic. So all mechanic. the all the rules in those connections. Uh, I'm trying to figure out how I want to really frame this. Um, give me your question again. I think I should start over with that one. <laughs> Can't, so you have time, space, charge, mass, and temperature as the fundament five fundamental dimensions. And Shiloh's basically like, okay, so if we accept that there is material bodies at the basis of all of this, can we then further simplify to say that the overarching rule is that bodies in motion relating to one another give us all these properties? Like, time is two objects moving relative to one another so you can have frames of their motion, and that's how you measure time. Space is the distance between bodies charge yeah. is the yeah. motion of the surface of a body mass is all of them get their their meaning in relation to their motion compared to the rest right exactly and that's that makes them real physical things because they continue to have that motion right so yes yeah i would say that temperature is a really w interesting one to me because temperature feels like an exclusively bulk phenomenon and yet we were talking to Nikki Fox, who runs the Parker Solar Probe, and she was talking about how, you know, they're out, their their probe is out where it's like a million degrees. And I was kind of like, 10 well, million. 10 million degrees. It's unbelievable, yeah. And I was like, how are you, how is it not breaking down? And she's like, well, there's very few particles there. And the, the ions. Very low pressure. What is it? Very low pressure, too. Yeah, like very low pressure. And so the temperature reading that they get is off of a single molecule that hits the detector and mm -hmm. it's translated to like millions of degrees. And I just sometimes like find myself thinking about that where I'm like, I feel like. Yeah. Because temperature is just average kinetic energy at some point. Right. And if your system only contains one particle, one interaction, then your average is extraordinarily high. Yeah. Like what would it feel like to get hit by something that's 10 million degrees, but only one of them? Probably like, wouldn't feel like anything like would you feel that i don't know i imagine i can see it going both ways i can imagine it just being so much motion that it vaporizes you but the fact that the detector isn't getting vaporized suggests that that's like completely false it's not destroying the detector yeah it probably wouldn't hurt too much <laughs> <laughs> exactly and so i guess i just so temperature for me is probably the strangest thing to think of as like as a, as a fundamental because it's really it's not it's even more strange than charge yeah, because like we, I have a, I have a model for charge that we've worked out that like I'm pretty content with. Let's not mess with that. But even charge can get strange <laughs> because you know you can have humans can let's say you can withstand extraordinary voltages as long as the the current is low, right? I mean, it's interesting how that plays out as well, right? You can be dealing with highly charged systems like a Tesla coil or something. You see these pictures of Tesla sitting in his laboratory, like with these huge lightning bolts all around him and he's, he's perfectly safe. And these are, I don't know, thousands of volts. Uh, I think tens of thousands. Yeah, maybe tens of thousands and yet it, it's still safe. So these, these things do, they're, they're difficult to apprehend uh, as tangible physical phenomena, I think. I guess what I'm trying to say is that when I think of temperature, I think of something that like appears as a useful metric at some density hmm. as opposed to being something that's fundamental but you've you've labeled it as a fundamental and so i wonder if you can well but what i've also said that i think these things are all part of a partition theory they're defining each other under motion so fundamental is going to be a 
a quantum size playing against another quantum size. It's not a dot. I want to be clear about that. There are no dots in the fundamentals here. Um, let's see. When you take, oops. I don't know where should we start with this. You guys know about the Dirac equation, right? Dirac equation, we take, well, usually people try to talk about it without the constants on. They say, let's put it in constants where all the constants are equal to one. But I really like the constants on there. It's more helpful. I mean, yeah, um, I think our only experience with it is understanding spin, quantum spin, essentially. Yeah, yeah. Um, or should I say describing quantum spin? <laughs> Of the five Planck constants, the Planck temperature is right there on the same level with the Planck time, I would say. Now, how should we treat that as fundamental? Well, it's fundamental on the same level that it shows up as the cutoff for the notion, the, the dimension of temperature in the construction of atoms. You know, in an empty universe, there would be no cutoff. It wouldn't mean anything. But once you've formed the universe, it's got cutoffs from its construction. And the cutoffs are known famously as the Planck constants, right? The Planck time is the minimum cutoff for time. The minimum amount of time, the minimum cycle possible for time to be in reference to. So if you try to think of it in terms of like a, a clock for a computer, Planck time would mean the smallest possible clock any computer ever, anywhere, for the rest of time could ever run on, <laughs> right? So that's the smallest possible clock, the Planck time. And then there's the blank length and the blank charge. And, and all of these are derived from basic black body experiments, from what I understand, right? This is all an extrapolation of the way that light behaves. At, 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 right? So they're not like fundamental, they're not foundational measurements per se. They're extrapolations from this. Oh, so, so yeah, none of them are direct measurements. All of the, the measurements are the constants in nature. And when you compare the constants in nature, you find the Planck constants. In fact, the Planck constants are the scales that the symmetries of the hyperbolic structure works on according to the Dirac equation, right? That's where the, the whole symmetry closes. Why? Still the big mystery. Like the Dirac equation is fantastic because it shows you symmetry closure in, in the system, but it doesn't give you any argument at all for why the scaling parameter of hyperbolic space was picked. Like it doesn't argue for its parameters. It just says, here they are. <laughs> anyway, a little side note. Yeah, I, I mean, I th whenever I think about the Planck's constant, I, I always go back to that black body work, and I, and I think about you know the idea of quantizing the photon and where this came about and and why that was necessary, and how all of the these relate all of the other things really fall out from that. And um, I'm actually pretty concerned about the black body work. Do you think about black bodies at all? I I do. Why are you concerned? Um, I'm worried about it because. I am not convinced that it's a universal relationship. So all of the black body work were, was done on these heated soot covered chambers. And so to produce this black body spectrum, you basically heat up a solid or liquid and you get this very nice uh, power density Whoa. curve of frequencies with respect to intensity. And, you know, I don't know if it was Planck. I think it was Planck. He really wanted to universalize this. He really wanted it to apply to all atoms everywhere. And so, I don't know if he harassed Kirchhoff or how this went down exactly, but Kirchhoff never observed that gases, that atomized uh, elements were able to actually produce this black body curve, but he built it into his equation that a sufficiently dense, uh, that a sufficiently dense gas would be able to produce the black body. And people kind of accepted that and moved on to the point that they started modeling the stars as gaseous as compressed gases that were because obviously stars give us this beautiful black body curve as well but there's never been an experiment done on earth that's ever demonstrated a black body curve from a gas or a gaseous plasma or any under any sort of pressure whatsoever and and i'm worried that it that that attempt by Planck to universalize it may have may have uh unwittingly extended that relationship to all of all of the universe and all of material uh, when in fact we only really know it's true for solid bodies and so I wonder if that Planck's constant isn't telling us something more about the material properties of that solid body with respect to its heat its temperature and its yeah. light and it's not really something universal at the end of the day 
It's just well, uh, it's if it's telling us something about solid bodies, wouldn't it be a universal statement about solid bodies? For sure, for sure. Yeah, but, okay. but but yeah. but but maybe not about gases. Maybe not about ionized atoms. Yeah. Maybe maybe not. Maybe maybe we're misconceiving the structure yeah, of the yeah. stars. And you have to stay open to that possibility. If you haven't done an experiment over a certain domain, but you've always applied your argument over that domain. That's exactly it. <laughs> that's all I'm getting at. It's like, I, I really liked it with these things go back to like, why do, why did we start thinking about this as a universal constant and, and really go back to, you know, one of the true pleasures of writing this book is we've been able to go back and read some of these fundamental experiments and try to understand like, where did people first come up with this idea of spin or Planck's constant or, you know, mm -hmm. why do people start thinking of electrons as these little bowling balls that get shot across the room by these guns? Like to really go back and look at the experiments and say, huh, that's interesting. They interpreted it that way because I think in many cases, these people were very ambitious with, and, and liberal with their interpretations. They wanted them to be true of everything all at once. And, and, and it's a very, and I understand why they wanted to do that. Um, but I think that there may be some fractures open in the deep past with respect to some of these foundational experiments that could teach us um, and perhaps complicate our, especially someone like you, complicate your job quite a bit um, because you're, of course, trying to simplify, simplify these relationships. Um, so that was a bit of a rant. But I think it's a fantastic approach to science in general, what you were saying, to, to keep that in mind about every concept you learn in science. It's not about the end word that now you got it right uh, like for memorizing a test. It's about knowing the logic that got you there. So you know where to look for confirmation or disconfirmation. You know where to go from there. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I just have the sense that a lot of the answers that we're seeking have been considered in the deep past in the, you know, they may not have made it into the journals. They might, they might be buried in the notes of people who have come across some of these ideas and we mm -hmm. celebrate these people so vigorously. And, and, and they're no married into the they myths of peoples. You know, oh, yeah. Because people in the past, you got to give it to them. They're, they would spend their whole life thinking, right? A common eight hours a day walking somewhere. You know how well you think when you walk, right? Yeah. You spend eight hours on average every day of your life <laughs> walking. You're thinking a lot. You got to give it to them. They, they really, really must have seen a lot if they're engaged with the world that much more. Yeah. I wonder what was lost that, that we could benefit from now if it hadn't been lost. Yeah, and like what we were talking about at the beginning, it's just interesting how we don't, I don't know that we expect to see these heroes appear like, like they were in the past, right? We, we sort of think of them as these mythological characters who <laughs> were around at the dawn of, uh, of these different disciplines, but that that's not something we should expect going forward, right? The, I, I don't know why that is, but I have the, I have the sense that it's just not something we expect to happen. We don't expect to have these people appear again in the future. I think that that's in the nature of what a discipline is. Because you can only have someone like that who's at the beginning of a discipline. You can't have somebody like that at the end of a discipline. Where the entire... Yeah. Like, the, the idea of physics... Like we at the beginning of the conversation kind of agreed that science is a modern enterprise and that physics is a relatively modern enterprise. And so we have all of these giants of physics, but you start to really dig around and you're like 1500s, 1600s, like 500 years mm -hmm. of, of a discipline. New. And so, oh, go ahead. It's new, yeah. I'm just screaming, yeah. <laughs> and so I think that it's possible to look back to the age of reason and the age of enlightenment and look at all these people and be like, man, they had really wild ideas. And they had wild ideas because what they had done is they had codified this nebulous natural philosophy. We try to understand all of nature at once and we have these philosophical principles that underpin everything. And we're like, well, no, 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 no. Hold on. There's, there's, chemistry and then there's biology and then there's physics and they kind of they they build upon each other and they relate to each other in certain ways and it seems to me that when we try to understand the constants of nature what we're trying to do is understand massively complex interdependent systems and that's something that we've never been able to do before like newton created the ability to understand motion through mathematics in a way that we had sensed intuitively and when we go out into the world we have an intuitive sense of the complexity of 
everything that is brought to bear on every moment of our existence, but we don't have the mathematics really to talk about it yet. Like we have some complexity theory, but it's not, it's not really mature yet. And so I think that what we need is the opening of new disciplines in order to be able to have this new kind of thinking because you, you have to have new ways of parameterizing it because that seems to be the only way that these things make progress. Yeah, we need to engage in making the diversity of thought go back up. <laughs> all new ideas, no matter how different they are, they offer something to idea, right? And so if we're all thinking the same, we've lost something inherently already. I think the diversity is very valuable for learning because it's always a surprise when someone comes to something brand new, right? That they discover something, look at this. Wow, how did we not see that before? Has it always been here? <laughs> but that surprise can come from anyone that looks there first and the walks and backgrounds that, that qualify you for that i mean it, the qualification is being unique if you have a different walk and different background if you've seen a different part of the world different things engaged in the world then you're definitely qualified uniquely qualified to try to make sense of the world okay so let's uh let's <clears throat> see everything goes perfectly and you you are able to articulate these these patterns and and events the fundamental constants of nature from the mathematics is that the end of physics no that's the beginning mm. right, it might be the beginning of consciousness for me the consciousness is one of those slippery words you have to define at the beginning of the conversation every time to, to make any progress but for me i think of consciousness as being what a being's conscious if it invents a story about its environment right or wrong is not the issue it's conscious if it has a story it's more conscious if its story is more effective. So it becomes an issue, right or wrong. It's not an issue whether you're conscious, it doesn't matter how conscious you are, how right your story is. I think when we get to the point where we actually understand reality all the way, we will then, or maybe not we, maybe the people after us, but at some point someone will get there and they'll be the first truly conscious people. That's that's how I feel. I think we're, we're playing at consciousness so far. We're, we're proto-conscious creatures. We're not fully conscious yet. And so at that point, the physics becomes more instrumentalized. It's more concerned with how do we manipulate these, this understanding in service of a better future? Is it a more technological enterprise at that point, as opposed to a scientific enterprise of understanding? Hmm. I feel like it's going to really in, uh, envelop the understanding level and engagement level. I think people are going to be able to code on the computer to do chemistry. Like starting out as kids, you can do simple chemi chemistry reactions, make a little gold bar of yourself and get all excited. But if you do that <laughs> growing up and you learn how to do all those little things, your brain is going to be so creative. You can make your own spaceship. <laughs> I think it'll be, it'll be maybe a little strange transition for people that are in the mode of thought we're in right now, but it might not be even fast transition anyway, so it might not be an issue. But when we go through that transition, I think it's natural for anyone born into the future world where we're not based on resources. Curiosity is natural. If you're already conscious, you want more consciousness. Nothing conscious wants less consciousness. So if you if you itemize or if you mainstream the process of bolstering individuals' consciousness by making them all more coherently aware of their environment, its degrees of freedom, and able to engage with it with more ease, <laughs> yeah, that's that's a whole different whole different level. Anyway, I don't know how long it's going to take. I just know that this goal is worth pursuing. It's worth every consciousness that can be aimed at it. That's the best tool, even better than AI still. The most powerful tool in the whole universe is your consciousness. And if you're willing to aim it somewhere on purpose to do some good, mm -hmm. get away from all the distractions because that really disrupts your consciousness. But if you can do that, you're given a gift from the first moment you start doing it, you're given a gift to the rest of the humanity because you're on the path to discover something. You're on the path to discover something. Everything that gets discovered is, hey guys, look at this afterwards. And now everyone else gets to discover it for free. The whole historical passage that we have in the past, all the things everyone else has discovered before, every artist, every person who's gone somewhere and done something no one else has done before and then reported it has woken us up and to the world we're in now. Let's keep waking up. There's a lot more to the world to enjoy. There's a lot more of the world to explore and engage with. There's a lot other ways to engage than the way we're focusing right now. And I think everyone knows this intrinsically. Everyone's 
had moments in life where they spent the whole day maybe in a jungle or in, in love in a forest. You know, there, there's so many days you could have engaged with nature, but it's overwhelming and unforgettable. But I think our future is going to be more full of those days, more full of those engagements, because the excitement you can have for figuring out reality really goes up powers and powers and powers up when you can actually dedicate more time to it. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that's the, the way things are going to eventually go. I'm just going to do everything I can to make that happen as fast as possible. But if people are wanting to participate, participating means dedicating your consciousness to figuring things out too trying to figure out how to see the world in a way you haven't seen, to notice degrees of freedom that haven't been noticed or connections that you haven't noticed, right? Just to make more sense of your world. It's not about trying to, to be, uh, prove to yourself you're wrong and then come back later and tell me, okay, I was wrong. That has nothing to do with telling me. You don't ever need to tell anyone else. It's about your own evolution of thought, being able to be aware of more. It's a powerful gift and, you know, only conscious beings have it. So it's worth it. <laughs> That's, That's beautiful. Really beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. I, I often, I was just thinking while you were saying that, that how my cat sometimes looks at me as if I already know how everything works. I, I just imagine sometimes she's like, it's like raining outside or something. And she's like, dude, what are you, why is this happening? Like, what are you doing? Like, you know, as if. Yeah. Why didn't you change this? Right. Right. And I'm like, well, we're not quite there, little guy. But I, I can definitely imagine that that's not an unreasonable supposition for that cat, you know, because I do think that that's the direction that this whole human project is moving, which is very bizarre to think that you're a part of it. And I think, a hu like you said, a huge part of it is just having that aim and cultivating your aim and, re and moving towards it slowly. And, and if everybody did that, you know, it's hard to it's hard to really even imagine what an incredible uh, degree of progress we could make in a very short amount of time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I feel I feel really aligned with with that mission. We spend a lot of time thinking about what that means and what good looks like and the things to aim for. And so it's good to find another person in the world who's preoccupied by the same questions. Thank you. It's been wonderful meeting you guys, by the way. Yeah, so we have a, a thing coming up in Texas. Right for the eclipse. Yeah, Are yeah. You, you want to come hang out? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think we we already got a, a ticket, so we're going to be there. But oh, cool! Yeah, yeah. That's fantastic. Okay, do you, uh, you should give a talk. Okay. Heck yeah! Yeah, okay. that'd be awesome. Yeah. Sweet. Cool. Yeah. Everybody listening should come hang out too. <laughs> yeah. It's. Uh, I think it's gonna be a pretty intimate setting this first time. This is something. First of all, we want to. You know, this is something we want to keep doing. So, this is our first conference, and we're learning the ropes and. We're, we're, it looks like it's going to be a really small yeah, space. I'll, I'll try everybody. to learn with you guys too. Uh, I mean, I'll try to learn with you guys too about bolstering more conferences in the future for the physics monastery. I gotta yeah, it's just always it's right amazing right. to me how how much more can get done when you're face to face with people. We like Anastasia just mentioned. We were just at Brian Keating's office at UC San Diego, and I was just like, it was the first live podcast we've ever done, and I was like, holy crap! This we've made so much more progress in this hour. Like it usually takes me an hour to just get warmed up with people. And I'm like, just being like three feet away from somebody, the tiny micro movements in the eyes. I don't even know what the hell is going on biologically, but we're like very, able very to get light. on the same plane very quickly. And yeah. so I'm just really, really looking forward to doing more of that in the future. And this conference, I think is going to be a great opportunity to practice, you know, the skills that it's going to take to pull that off. Where, where in Utah are you? Uh, Logan. I have no idea where that is. Uh, hour and a half north of Salt Lake in okay. the mountains. We, yeah. um, I think that we're going to be passing through there in the spring, and so it'd be cool to stop by and like yeah. see see from the physics to. monastery. Okay. And if people want to find out more about what you're doing, you guys have a website. Uh, do you? Is there a good way to get in contact or find out more? Yeah, I usually have people contact Matthew, but uh, okay. <laughs> we, we do have a website coming up soon. It should be live in January. Okay. Um, it'll be the physics monastery dot everything, I think, dot earth is the one we pick. But I think he's getting all the ones again. Yeah. yeah. And thanks to Matthew for putting us in contact to you. And, and, uh, and just for being an incredible member of our community. He comes to our patron chat every week and he always has really insight. He just has such deep insight onto the world. He's just got such a light in his eyes, too. Just really. Really cranks up yeah, the spirit. Yeah, he, he's of another person that has dedicated himself to trying to make a positive difference. I mean, he came over here, and we don't do anything but try to figure out the physics stuff. We learn math, we do physics, 
we don't do anything i mean other than sleep at night you know <laughs> and he's been willing to come do that I and mean, he's literally being a monk that way and you don't know many people that are willing to do that so that's that's cool that's incredible yeah definitely cool man well i guess we will let you go and we'll see you in person next cool all yeah. right thank thank you, thanks again for coming by and hanging thank out you. Yeah. all right nice to meet you guys think about. have a great rest of your day right, bye everybody okay.